Okay, what we're going to be talking about now is uh, basically what in the United States is called green manure cover, green manures. Uh, in, in the uh, developing countries, we're calling it more and more green manure cover crops because we have several uses for them. Green manure means it's plants that fertilize the soil like manure does. Cover crops are plants that control weeds. And actually, if I could change this name now, which I can't because it's, it's very widely used at this point, I would add something else that, <laughs> that took in the, also the factor that something we've discovered just in the last five to 10 years of working with these things is that they also help control droughts. In fact, they pretty much eliminate droughts. The droughts we've been having in Africa that everybody else is attributing to climate change are about 20% because of climate change and about 80% because of the nature of the soil and the fact that the soil has lost all its organic matter or the vast majority of it. And therefore it can neither allow rain to come to infiltrate into the soil or uh, hold the rain once it gets in the soil. The, the water just keeps going on through. So these things, in fact, as I say here, are a very low cost, often have a negative cost. Often they, they make farmers money at the same time that, do, that they're doing all these other things for the soil, the weeds, and uh, the droughts, and so forth. So it's, it's definitely a multi-purpose innovation. Um, and there are more innovations, that, excuse me, more purposes that I will mention later. But this is basically a technology that is, is um, spreading quite quickly uh, because there are a number of traditional systems, the total number of farmers right now in the developing world using green manure cover crops is somewhere well over 25 million people. Now the ones that are introduced, have been introduced to this are probably, some, probably closer to maybe three or four million. Uh, but that number is also increasing quite rapidly. So we're talking about a very, very important technology that is uh, hopefully going to um, change the way farmers do things on a number of continents. And before I get going with the pictures, I want to also say in, in relation to what people were talking about in the last session, this is to some extent relevant in that more and more we're using more and more different species of green manure in the same fields. As in, and as you can see in the, the photo here, behind the farmer, there's maize with the green manure cover crop growing up but we can grow three or four different green manures under the maize and usually one or two above in the form of trees. Uh, so that um, we, our, our golden rule of green manure cover crops, although it seems like a long ways away from something like alfalfa, which was used in the States for many years, is that we're trying, basically trying to recreate a forest. We want, we want farmers fields to look more and more like a forest but still have room for the maize to grow in them. Now that sounds funny, but if you look up behind this fellow, the maize has grown very, very well, yet he has another crop growing in there that's quite aggressive and is growing right up the maize. Uh, but we can also add a tree to that. Now this one, we couldn't add much else because it covers everything under it. But uh, we can grow three and four and five green manures and hopefully in coming years, we'll learn to grow even more different plants in the same field so that it more and more looks and acts like a forest. Roland, I'm sorry, a quick question. I don't understand manure. It's, you're just talking about another crop. You're not actually talking about any form of biological manure. Yes, green manure, green manure refers to plants that fertilize the soil. The word manure is there because they do the same thing that manure does. But okay. they're plants. Great, thank you. In other words, that plant that's climbing up the maze behind this farmer here is what we call a green manure cover crop. Got it, thank you. And there's nothing, there's no manure from animals in there at all. Okay, I'll, I'll explain why later. Um, now let's look at this photo in, in itself. It, it sort of is a, is a good overview of what green manure cover crops can do. First of all, look at the black soil at the farmer's feet. That soil was not like that color at all six years ago before this photo was taken. It was white. Uh, the amount of organic matter that's been put in that soil is a tremendous amount and it does completely change the texture as well as the color as well as the water infiltration, as well as a number of other characteristics of the soil and the ability of it to hold moisture. So that's made a major change. Why? Because of the green manures. The, uh, another impact is what he's showing us in his hands. He has a small ear of, of corn in his left hand and two large ears in his right hand. 
That's the difference between what he used to harvest five years ago and what he harvests now from each plant. In other words, he's increased his yields by about three times, getting two large ears instead of one small ear on each uh, ear of corn. That means, for instance, that he more, has more than enough maize to uh, feed his family, and he no longer has to work on, as, a, as a peon on a uh, sugar cane plantation about 50 miles away from home. He can stay at home, be with his family, and grow more maize than they will ever be able to eat. Where, where is also, this, Roland? Pardon? Where, where is he? Where is this guy, the farmer? Who is he? No, well, who or where is he? Ah, this, this particular photo is from Honduras, mm -hmm. um, where I worked for about uh, 19 years. Before that, I worked in Guatemala for 12 years, and the last 10 years I've been working in, in Africa, in the, a number of different countries. But uh, anyway, so, so the next thing you can see in the photo is that there's some grass behind him, and all that his son is also sitting on. That's a napier grass barrier that keeps the, wa the water uh, washing away with his soil. Uh, uh, it's on a contour, and, and there is a hill behind him, although you can't see it because of all the, the, the um, organic matter growing there, frankly. Uh, but, uh, uh, and the amount of soil that that is trapped, that started to erode down the hillside and was stopped by the grass, is very easy to see because his son is sitting on that, that pile of, of ground. In other words, uh, gradually that row of grass, which was very easy to plant, took a couple of days uh, to, to uh, protect a whole hectare of land, which is about two and a half acres. Um, and uh, now after about six years, he's got almost a meter of soil that would have flown down the, down the hillside if it hadn't been trapped by that grass which he's sitting on. And the last thing I love about this photo is that, that um, Laureano's son is still living in the village in most of Honduras and, and huge areas of Africa. You never meet a young fellow his age in the villages because uh, they've all gone to the cities because they know that their, their farms, their, their, their parents' farms are not gonna be producing anything within 10 or 20 years. I mean, they're, 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 they're just gonna no longer be producing. And so uh, Roland, pardon me, this, right this now, is Charlie Shore. I have a statistic for Latin America, but in Africa right now, um, the average age of a smallholder farmer out in, the, out in the villages is 54. All the youth have gone to the slums because they just don't see any. Roland, pardon me. Uh, this is Charlie Shore. Uh, the traditional recommendation is to add uh, a certain oh. amount of br brown biomaterial to your compost pile. Do you know uh, specifically why the green? Is, is the green manure better than a mixed manure? Or uh, do we have any data on that? Well, uh, better in what way? Um, frankly, forests don't, uh, don't do that sort of thing. Forests just drop leaves on the ground and you know they, they uh, rot and they, uh, the worms and so forth take them down into the soil and so forth. I mean, if we're gonna follow the, the traditional systems, uh, you know, now the one thing we haven't done yet that we feel we should do in order to imitate a forest is to have animals incorporated in this. Now we certainly have a lot more earthworms than, than uh, you know, than uh, the, uh, this kind of soil used to have. But uh, we'd like to see how we can incorporate some other animals that aren't gonna eat the maize. So, so we're working on that. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, problem is, the problem is comparing compost with this is, is, uh, is not very productive and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, okay, we'll, we'll move to the next photo. Okay, when in world history were green manures first used? Now I was gonna ask everybody, but since this is a virtual conference, it's, it's, that's not so easy. But I'm sure the answer will surprise you. There are in existence today articles advising farmers on how to use green manure crops from both Europe and China that were written before the Christian era. So these things have been around a long time. Now, a lot of scientific articles during the last, uh, well, especially in the, 18, in the 1990s and the early 2000s were uh, had tried some green manures in, in, in ways you should never use them. 
and then concluded that because they hadn't worked that green manures don't work in general. Uh, but if somebody tells you that green manures don't work, how can they explain that for 500 years in Europe and over 200 years in the United States, in other words, the entire history of our both areas before World War II, virtually every commercial farmer used green manures. I mean, were, were farmers incompetent in those days? I don't believe that. I believe that in fact green manures do work and I, I know they work because we, we use them now and farmers adopt them at a, at a very fast clip. But uh, you know, you'll still read literature that says green manures don't work or for instance, there was an article just written about three years ago by Ecraft in, uh, in Nairobi saying that while only trees really uh, work as green manures, uh, other plants don't. Well, you know, this is just patently false. It's just wrong. Okay, now, because almost all our textbooks on soils are written, have at least one author who is from a fertilizer company, and I checked that out one day in the Mann Library at Cornell, which is one of the best agricultural libraries in the entire United States. I found 15 different textbooks that were uh, in, uh, first year textbooks for college students that were studying soils, uh, 15 of them. Every single one of them had at least a co-author who was a, an active employee of a fertilizer company. So they don't say too much very positive about green manure cover crops. But what, uh, this photo is very interesting. This is, this is the experience that made us start working with green manure cover crops back in 1983. Um, it was a farmer who didn't believe what we were saying about uh, organic matter and its importance in the soil, even though we didn't know the half of it back then or the tenth of it. And uh, so he was going to try out, try it out and see if, if what we were saying was true. So he made 16 compost heaps and poured it into the soil in the left hand part of this photo. And then he left two rows of maize. We had taught people to experiment because we believe farmer experimentation has to be part of any extension process. We, uh, uh, so he left two rows without any compost. Uh, one, you can see where the arrows are. And the other one is about half as tall as the others and a little bit yellower, right in the dead center in the center of the photo. Okay, now that maze there obviously sent some roots over and stole some of the compost from its neighbors. <laughs> but the row that, ha you know, ab absolutely has no compost is the one where the arrows are. That row of maize and the maize on the left hand side of the photo are all the same seed planted on the same day. Okay, now I didn't even believe it myself. <laughs> The farmer didn't show us this field until this day that I took this photo because he was so embarrassed that he'd been so wrong. <laughs> and we had no idea that that, that, you know, a lot of compost could that make that much difference. We had no idea. But uh, you can see it there. In fact, uh, the day after uh, I took this photo, I went around to all this fellow's neighbors and asked them what they knew about these plots and whether the maize was all planted at the same time and whether he'd snuck a little bit of chemical fertilizer in there and all this sort of thing. And they said, no, 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 that's all because of compost. Okay, so Roland, we decided I have a we question. had to do something to try and increase the amount of organic matter in people's soils. And Roland, uh, because the, the, the problem all over the world is that the maze looks like the maze in the center there, and sometimes even the maze on the right instead of the maze on the left. Yeah, did somebody want to say something? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. I, I want to know, why do you use the term green manure rather than gilded growing? Is that for funding reasons or ecological reasons? Green manure rather than? Using the term growing in gilds. You're growing in gilds. You're growing a, a, towards a seven layer forest system. Yeah. Um, and so I why are you using that term the Because word? that's the traditional uh, agricultural term. And then in Latin America, people have adopted green manure cover crops as a way of saying that we do both. We improve the soil and we control weeds but it's just it's, it's so it's a tra transitional term nothing else i mean I, I i i like your other terms better but but you know people I have are not with, ready for them okay yeah i mean see i usually show this to agricultural people and green manures and green manure cover crops are the terms they know yeah. i got you so this is this is what people can do now there's another thing they can do which is even more surprising. I didn't even, you know, I, I'd worked for 20 years with green manure cover crops before I discovered this because I'd been working more in 
in areas where there was a fair amount of rain. This is in drought prone Africa on the island of Madagascar. And this woman, uh, as you can see, her maize field is not doing real well there. She's got maize and then little clumps of what we call cow peas, which is, uh, uh, well, the black eyed pea in the United States is a, is, is a, is one, is a cow pea, type of cow pea. You can see the leaves are all curled up very tightly on this maize. Uh, that's a sign of drought, okay? I mean, the, the maize will turn yellow and so forth if it doesn't have nutrients, but if it doesn't have water, it will, the leaves will curl up. And they look like, look like somebody's rolled a cigarette or something. And, uh, but uh, she also has a field right next to this. And you can see some of the field over on the right extreme of the photo in the background, where you see a massive, really dark green color. Well, here's that field. Now, these photos were taken about 10 minutes apart from each other. <laughs> They're both in the same field. And I can prove that in one very simple way that was just totally a, a fluke. If you look up at the top right extreme of this photo, you'll see three clouds. One is pointed on the right, then there's a real small one, and then there's a sort of a roundish one on the left, okay? An oval, ovaloid cloud. Those, those three clouds are just left of center in this photo. You can see they're exactly the same clouds. These photos were taken a few minutes away from each other and a few meters or, or yards away from each other, okay? In other words, this maze went through the same drought that the other maze did, unless you believe that <laughs> you know, rainfall sort of stops right at a fence line. And <laughs> you know, this, this, this had just as much drought as the other one did, but this one in fact is gonna produce quite well. Now you can see it went through a drought because near the vetiver grass on the right, you can see some of the leaves there are slightly curled. But if you look at the center and the center left of the photo, you're gonna see the vast majority of the leaves are flat as a pancake, okay? And that's in spite of the fact this maize is growing better and, and each plant has gotten more um, moisture in spite of the fact that the density of plants here is much, much greater. If you look here, you'll see the plants were planted quite a ways away because she knew that, that, uh, there was, that uh, uh, the plants were not gonna grow very well and they needed all the water and all the nutrients they could get. So she planted them really far apart just to be able to get some kind of a harvest, which she probably won't because of the drought. But in this case, they're planted much closer together because she knows this land is fertile and uh, it's going to hold plenty in, of water. The reason for the difference is that that cow pea down there, which is also in this photo, the same plant, has been growing for six years on this field. And on, this is the first year it was grown on this field. That's the only difference between the two fields. Okay. That's the impact that green manure cover crops can have on rainfall. I've now seen similar experiences in five different countries in Africa, all the way from Mali in West Africa to Kenya in East Africa and uh, Madagascar and Mozambique and, and Malawi in Southern Africa. So this is something that will happen virtually everywhere. And um, this is very good news because Africa right now is suffering from severe droughts and they're gonna get worse and worse. Okay, so what are green manure cover crops? Green manure cover crops are defined as any plants with trees, bushes, climbers, crawlers, creepers, or even water boner plants that farmers can use among many other things to fertilize the soil, control weeds, or um, uh, end the droughts, okay? Now, what are the other advantages? Of, well, what are all the advantages of green manure cover crops? It's really amazing what they can do. First of all, we get a lot more soil organic matter and increased soil nitrogen because these, most of them, the vast majority of them are uh, legumes. And uh, that means that um, they are fixing nitrogen. In fact, they fix tremendous amounts of nitrogen as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, we can, most farmers in Africa with these green manure cover crops can go from about one ton, which is the average in Africa right now, of maize per hectare per year, up to um, uh, three and sometimes four tons. Four tons is a, is a very, those are good results, but, but we're getting that more and more and more. 
So they're able to Howard, I have a question. the yields they used to get just six or eight years previously. Howard? Lower Roland. Roland? Yeah. Um, is it important for the growing seasons of the different crops to, to kind of overlap so that you don't have like bare ground in winter and so forth? I realize a lot of these, you're talking about tropical countries, but um, do you want to have one, one plant growing while the other is declining? Absolutely. We want to try and keep uh, live roots in the ground all the time. And this is, this is important, uh, not just because farmers have noticed it and seen it, seen it. It's also important because we're finding out now from research on microbiology that um, the existence of live roots help maintain all sorts of population of really, really positive, uh, beneficial microorganisms in the soil, uh, especially fungi. Um, and uh, uh, this is very, very important if you really want to get high yields. So, uh, so uh, yes, we want to keep roots in the soil all the time. That's one of the reasons we use trees so often, um, because obviously trees have their roots in the soil for 50 solid years, 100 solid years, depending on the species. Um, and all the green manures we use in the droughty areas of Africa, um, are legumes which are capable of growing through the dry season okay and then of course we have to have fences and we've just found a really wonderful live fence just two years ago that, that uh, is working tremendously well to keep uh, the cattle out the free roaming cattle during the dry season so so uh, yes the answer is uh, uh, yes with an exclamation point to your question <laughs> okay so what is the live fence a live fence is is, is usually a tree that uh, will grow. Usually it has some small thorns on it to keep the animals from leaning against it in order to get in. And uh, that will grow, but that can be pruned so that it's not too tall and it doesn't take up too much space for where farmers want to plant their crops. Um, Which species do you, are you using? Well, the one we're using right now has a kind of a funny name. It's called the monkey thorn tree. It's an acacia. Uh, an acacia that's that's uh, native to to uh, southern Africa, and uh, it's so popular that we're selling the seed. We aren't giving it away. We're selling it at about three dollars a kilo, and uh, farmers are thrilled. They're 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 this last year in one little program that we only spent four thousand dollars on. Uh, farmers planted over fifty, well, uh, thirty miles, fifty kilometers of fencing <laughs> in one year. You know, and they were buying all the seed. I mean, you know, the, it's I have I have rarely seen farmers so thrilled with anything I've I've worked with. Okay, so this can be accomplished by smallholder farmers at virtually no cost, and with no fertilizer. Um, in fact, if the green manures are plants like the Lab Lab plant that I'll show you in a minute, uh, they also produce food. In fact, high protein food. And that means that usually they are making money. Uh, the, the food will more than, this, this food, if they sell it in the market, will more than cover the costs, the few costs they had in planting the green manure. So you're getting fertility, you're getting drought resistance, you're getting weed control at a negative cost in many cases. Okay, now not always. Sometimes there is a little bit of uh, cost in labor. There's no cost in, in um, or well, Okay, they have to buy a handful of seed to get started. From then on, they, 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 they um, produce their own seed. And so there's, there's, after the first year, there's no cost whatsoever. And the handful of seed will cost a few pennies. So it's an extremely low cost technology that has tremendous impact on farmers' well-being. Three, high proteins for food. Legumes, of course, have more proteins than, than uh, most of the grains people are eating now. Four, fourth, Dry season fodder for animals. We'll see a case of that a little later. Five, help in controlling weeds. And this is very important, especially for women, um, because, uh, for instance, maize has to be weeded twice. The second, and women do all the weeding of food crops. So that's a tremendous, that's, that's the worst, um, it's the worst labor women have to do during the year in terms of physical strength and, and just being out in the sun and the whole business. Furthermore, the second weeding happens right at the height of the hunger season, which, which comes before you get your next crops. So the second weeding, they're not only doing the, uh, you know, months of work 
swinging a hoe out in the fields, they're doing it without having had a decent breakfast or lunch or dinner. Um, so eliminating that second weeding is tremendously important for the women, believe me. Um, okay, prohibition of droughts. There was a farmer in, um, in Zambia that we were visiting that was using green manure cover crops because of a, of a non-governmental organization working there. Um, prior to my arrival, I mean, I had nothing to do with it. And um, uh, he, this farmer we were visiting had wonderful maize looking like the maize on the left of that first photo I showed you, or the second photo. And um, all around him, the maize was less than waist high and, and in severe, uh, uh, suffering severely from droughts. One of the uh, visitors with me asked him, well, what's going on here? How come, how come your field is so much better than all the rest? And the farmer said, well, those of us that planted Gliracidia trees six years ago have prohibited the droughts. <laughs> That was the way he said it. <laughs> and I, I like that saying, so I use it. Um, but anyway, we can prohibit the droughts. Seven, sequestration of tremendous amounts of atmospheric carbon, reducing climate change. Okay, this is something we didn't cotton to until about four or five years ago also. But we are putting 40 to 50 tons per hectare. Now this is green weight, not dry weight. 40 to 50 tons per hectare per year of organic matter in the soil. Very close to 50% of all that organic matter is carbon, okay? So that means 25 tons we're putting in the soil each year. Now, of that, a lot of it will escape and be, uh, you know, it becomes part of microorganisms that breathe and so they exhale some of it in, in, in the form of carbon dioxide, just like humans do, et cetera, et cetera. So, so of the long-term carbon, which is the important part, uh, when the soils, once the soils are fairly good, which like I say, it takes four or five years, but once they've gotten their organic matter content of the soil up to a decent level, the soil will sequester using even the sort of just medium quality green manure cover crop systems that we use, will sequester somewhere around six tons per hectare of maize long-term. Now that means, well, I'll, I'll talk about, well, actually, let me go ahead and say it now. That means that at that rate, and you can do the arithmetic if you want, uh, if all the farmers in the world, both large and small scale, were to use green manure cover crops and get the same levels of productivity. Now, farmers in the United States are gonna have a rough time doing that because of the ecological conditions, but the ranchers should be able to, to uh, exceed it quite significantly. So they should be able to average the same as what we're getting in Africa between the farmers and the ranchers. If all the farmers and the ranchers of the world were to sequester this much carbon in the soil long-term, they alone would meet over 75% of all the carbon sequestration we need to do by the year 2100 in order to meet the Paris Accord goals. 70%. That's a, that's a total uh, game changer. I mean, even, even uh, you know, I read recent uh, magazines by Time and by The Economist, where they had the whole magazine dedicated to climate change. They never mentioned this fact once. They never mentioned anything about green, about cover crops. They, they don't even know that this is happening. But smallholder farmers in Africa, just the smallholder farmers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America could sequester over 5%. Of all the carbon that we need to meet the the Paris Accord goals, and if all the farmers in the world, including the wealthy farmers, did the same thing, like I say, we'd meet over 75% of the the goals for for sequestering carbon uh, that were uh, stated by the Paris Accords. All a lot of this pessimism that both those magazines, for instance, had about reaching the goals is totally because of ignorance, you know, it's poorly informed um, judgments. Okay, now I'm sure you've never seen a, a, photo, a photo like this, at least not in any textbooks in the United States. These are the nodules from one single green manure cover crop plant from the uh, genus Mucuna, okay? 
Makuna Piriens. Okay, those are whole golf balls of of nodules. Now, if you remember your college textbooks, they would have one little, maybe two, one little nodule, maybe two millimeters in diameter every inch or two inches along a root. Well, that's fertilizer company propaganda. <laughs> That's nonsense. I mean, you know, we wouldn't work with these things if that's all they could fix. These things are fixing tremendous amounts of nitrogen in the soil. In fact, this particular plant is not the best we have. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the best plant we have for fixing nitrogen out of the more than 100 species of, of plants we use um, in different parts of the world, the one that fixes the most nitrogen is one that grows up in high altitudes in the Andes, which means it would grow very well in the northern United States. But I don't think, I don't know of anybody that has it. <laughs> it's called um, Cardwe. Uh, and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a member of the uh, lupin family. It also has a uh, edible seed to it, but it fixes the equivalent of, in a hectare of about... Uh, Six, what 16 sacks of urea would provide, which Can is more you than the United States would ever put on his crops. Okay, it fixes 480 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. Okay, so you know, the, the, we're talking about a totally new ball game in terms of how much nitrogen and, and how much <coughs> organic matter we can get in the soil. Well, well and could please you spell, spell, it. Can you please spell it? Spell that word, please. The uh, name of the plant, yes. yes. Okay, I think in English it's spelled T A R W I. It's uh, Lupinus. Ooh, I can't remember. But anyway, it'll it it should be on on uh, you know if you uh, Google that you should get it. Uh, in Spanish it's spelled T A R H U I, but it's a uh, like I say it's a lupin, and uh, it's grown all over the the Andes. Actually, it has different names in Spanish, about a different name in each country. Okay. Uh, Roland, this 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 is Mucuna Piriens, and it's it'll be all over the literature. Is there any um, comparable one for North America that's a native that we could use without spoiling the native lupins or something? Uh, well, this isn't going to spoil any of your native lupins. I mean, they have it all over the Andes, and there's all sorts of other lupin plants there, too. So, I mean, you know, it's not, we don't, if, if a plant is going to become invasive, we don't use it. In other words, those, those hundred species I talk about, actually, it's, it's somewhat over a hundred. Um, uh, and that doesn't even, mention, that doesn't even include the trees. But um, uh, of those, um, What was I going to say? Well, well, I'm just looking oh, for a those, Native those, American. Those, I'm counting only those that we've eliminated, those, those that we haven't eliminated because uh, they can be, um, they can become a problem. You know, they can right. I was just wondering if you had North America ones that were native to North America. That we well, can use. The, uh, the one I think, I'm, I'm not sure if it's native, but it's been, in, well, yes, it is because it was here before the, before the uh, white people came. So yes. The uh, the one the one that would be the best is one you probably have eaten. It's called fava beans. Uh huh. Now it'll fix it'll fix about a quarter of what that plant I was talking about does, but that's still that's more than enough for your crops to do very very well. Yeah, just grow fava beans. You know, uh, ro rotate fava beans with whatever else you're growing in your garden, and you'll see a big difference in your garden. Do you, Roland, do you use uh, on, on these fields that you're working with in Africa and elsewhere, do you, do you also use no-till farming? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. In fact, we use conservation agriculture, which has three rules, one of which is, is no-till or, or minimum till at least. And um, frankly, what happens almost always with these green manures is after about two or three years, the farmer starts saying, my gosh, my soil is really soft now. And uh, it's dark and everything. You know, I'm, I'm going to try not uh, plowing because, I mean, what's the point of plowing? I'm, it's like plowing the ocean, <laughs> and uh, which is a Bolivarian, Simon Bolivar 
said that. I, I wasn't the first one to invent that <laughs> phrase. But anyway, uh, yeah, usually farmers themselves, after about three or four years, will realize there's no point in plowing anymore and they'll quit. Is that because the soil is simply soft enough to shove the seeds in without preparing the a row? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And the weeds are able to go way down into the soil without any effort and so forth and so on, yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, which is another uh, reason why I say that these, these things often are, are uh, uh, have a negative cost because, you know, if you eliminate weeding and you eliminate plowing, uh, you're saving a lot, of, a lot of labor and a lot of cost. So, you know, the, uh, for smallholder farmers. So, uh, you know, uh, if you get something that can do both of those, then, then you're gonna save yourself a lot of money in addition to all the benefits that these things provide. Okay, uh, talking about high protein foods. I was in on the island of Sumatra once. Well, I've been there several times, but, and uh, the, the agronomists were telling me in Southern Sumatra that, well, you know, in Indonesia, we don't have green manures because because um, we don't eat beans, we don't eat peas, you know. They cause flatulence and we don't like that, so we just don't eat them. So anyway, the first lunch we stopped, the first time we stopped at a little uh, roadside restaurant to have lunch, they served us what you see in this photo. Well, the green pods there are cowpea pods. They're like green beans that we use, except a different species. The uh, the little sprouts are mung bean sprouts, which are also a green manure cover crop. And over on the left, you have tofu made out of soybeans. Turns out the farmers were using two and three and four different green manure crops in every field they had. <laughs> you know, and, and here we were eating them. They weren't, they weren't actually, you know, we weren't actually eating little round beans, but never in the products of, of green manure cover crop species. Okay, the use of green, green manure cover crops is a major game changer in terms of climate change. Even just a moderately good green manure cover crop system, such as the planting, such as planting peanuts under pigeon peas. Uh, if you've never heard of pigeon peas, it's the fourth, fourth most widely eaten grain in the entire world after, after um, rice, maize, and, and uh, wheat. It can sequester, this system can sequester long-term about 5.8 tons, that's what I said, about six tons per hectare per year of carbon in a decent soil. And I go on to say what I said earlier, that, that if all the farmers and ranchers in the world were, were to achieve anything similar to this, they could be uh, sequestering, well, here it says over 85%, I say over 75% just to be uh, cautious, that would be needed to reach the goals of the Paris Accords for the year 2100. In fact, I just received some uh, reports from peer-reviewed uh, literature uh, describing what some, some researchers have found in southern Malawi using uh, Gliracidia, which is one of the species I'll talk about in a minute, with maize for over 10 years, and they have, they have produced about double this amount of long-term carbon. So, you know, I'm, I'm well within the ballpark here. How can we accomplish all this? The only solution is to build up soil organic matter in the farmer's fields and to do it with green manure cover crops. For smallholder farmers, there's not enough animal manure to do this. If they had enough animals to, to uh, do that on even one hectare of land, they'd be rich people. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't be poor farmers anymore. Compost takes far too much work. To even just um, fix up two and a half acres or one hectare, uh, I've calculated that it would take depending on how far you had to go to get the materials and stuff, it would take somewhere around four to five months of work, working totally just making compost every day for four or five months to, to produce that amount of organic matter. If we're, you know, compost is great for, for, for uh, kitchen gardens. It's great for uh, high value to the extent that you can, uh, fertilizing high value fruits and vegetables but not for maize and, and sorghum and millet, cassava and the other basic grains of, around the world. It doesn't pay. It's way too much work. Green manure cover crops, however, can produce over 40 tons per hectare per year of fresh organic matter each year. In over 50 years of working with smallholder farmers, I have never seen or heard of 
any smallholder farmer producing even 10 tons of compost in one year. So, I mean, this the compost is just totally out of, it's, it's totally insufficient to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, fertilize and, and increase the fertility of a, of a decent sized smallholder farmer's fields. It's just, it's impossible. Roland, I just need to interrupt for one second. Yeah. Um, you have about 10 minutes left, but okay. then after that, you'll be in a workshop and whoever wants to join you to go deeper into this conversation. Okay, is, fine. Is of fine. Course yeah, thank you. Yourself. Thank you for telling me that. I, I have another question that has to do with this green manure. Um, I'm wondering when you have um, like mining sites and things like that where there's no topsoil left really, can these um, green manure legumes and things like that, are they able to take hold in um, when there's no topsoil and try and be pioneer species to create okay. Um, in cases where they've taken off the top layer, like they're taking material for building roads or they're mining or something like that, then, then uh, th these things are not going to be able to grow. What you'll probably have to do is either bring in a little bit of soil or bring in a little bit of soil and, and a little bit of animal manure, which would be even better, and uh, then, then they will grow. Now, if, if it's just, if the land is just degraded land that's become what we call wasteland, because it won't even grow pasture for animals, uh, then yes, these green, some of these green manures, not all of them, some of them. Uh, the, the best one is jack bean. But we can take jack bean into a field. It's, uh, I, I'll talk about that in a minute. And um, the jack bean will grow, I've seen it grow in everything except established grasslands. Now, if the grass has been growing there for five or six years, uh, then, then the the jack bean can't compete with the grass roots. It, 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 it's just too big a mat of roots that, that competes with the jack bean, so it won't grow, or won't grow well. But uh, in a in a soil that say was was farmed any time in the last two or three years, or just you know is, is you know is is basically bare because it's you know it's it's becoming desert. Uh, yes, the the jack bean will will be able to grow there. And and even uh, the the pigeon pea and probably the glyrus city, if if it doesn't have a real low pH, if the glyrus city is down below about four point five, then uh, then it won't uh, it won't do well. But for instance, I've worked in the what they call the Kalahari sands of western Zambia, which are white sand that goes down five meters before you get any color at all in the soil. Okay, it's just pure white sand, and uh, both the um, well, the Glyrosidia, no, the Glyrosidia didn't do very well because it had a low pH, I think. But the pigeon pea and the jack bean did quite well. So yes, we can we can start out with what most farmers think is impossible, is land that's impossible to grow anything on, and we can turn that into a good field within three years. Okay, I've done that with jack bean in quite a number of different places. Uh, Roland, yeah, what, what is a small hold farm? Uh, how big is that, and what and what's a heck? And and most I don't think most of us know what a hectare is. We grow up a little okay. square, mi I, I square be miles and acres. Everything into uh, acres for for you. <laughs> the uh, smallholder farmers in Africa have a different definition than in in uh, uh, most of Latin America. But usually, we consider smallholder farmers to be farmers that have less than about four or five hectares, which would be about ten acres, ten to twelve acres. Um, now in Brazil, they go a lot higher than that because they don't have any smallholder farmers by that definition, or very few. So they they talk about smallholder farmers that farmers having that have 20 or 30 uh, acres. But in in Africa and most of Latin America and Asia, a smallholder farmer is somebody that has uh, less than about 10 or 15 acres. Okay. Uh, why don't and we most hold of off? Them, most hold of off them on... nowadays have less than five acres. I mean, in Africa, the average smallholder farmer holding right now is one and a half hectares, which is about, uh, would be about three and a half to four acres. Uh, so why don't we hold off with questions at the moment and let Roland finish his slideshow? I'm, I'm yeah. pretty close to the end, yeah. Okay, and then we'll, oh, yeah. we'll go to our workshop space. Yeah, there are at least 115 green manure cover crop species present. Oh, how many, how much do I have? About five more minutes? Five minutes, yeah. Okay. 
There are at least 115 green manure cover species presently being used around the world, not counting the trees. And I only count the, the, the systems, uh, which I only count the species which farmers are using at least five years after any outside influence has left the area and um, that is still being used by at least 100 farmers. So, you know, I, I, you know th these, these are sustainably used species of green manure cover crops somewhere in the world. Probably the most useful for smallholder farmers uh, generally around the world, the most widely useful, are jack beans, which I've already mentioned, kind of alia, lab lab beans, I also mentioned, and gliracidia trees. Okay, I've mentioned all three of them actually. Okay, here's jack beans. This is growing in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, uh, where there was such a drought that the vast majority of the maize died. You can only you can see there's probably only uh, one tenth of the maize plants still still there. Uh, because of the drought, and yet the jack beans look like they were irrigated yesterday. Okay, they're extremely drought resistant. They grow in very, very poor soils. Uh, these are these are these are very poor soils, and uh, within two or three years, that maize will be looking totally different. Okay. And the jack bean is edible? No, no, this is this is not edible. Okay. It's it's interesting, but but there is a there is a uh, uh, evolutionary reason for 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 this the the plants that are edible usually require better soils and more water and that's because in a really droughty area like the edge of a desert or in a pure desert um, you have very few other plants so the animals all come and eat <laughs> you know if you've got an edible plant in there the animals are going to finish it off because there isn't that much to eat out there okay so the plants that do well in a desert or in a really dry area have developed either thorns or, or anti-nutritional factors or a terrible taste or something that will keep the animals from eating them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have survived. <laughs> how, how can they plant seeds through all that undergrowth? That undergrowth is all, is all jack bean. There's no weeds there. Well, there are a few no, weeds know, right up in the foreground. How do you get seeds down into the earth? Pardon? How do you get seeds down into the earth through all that greenery? Well, the greenery isn't there at the beginning of the wet season when you plant. See that greenery? Perennials? Well, the greenery you see in the in the bottom half of the photo is all jack bean. That's all green manure. It's completely eliminated the weed. But how do you put a seed? What is does it die okay. off? In a lot of cases, for instance, in this case in Mexico, what they would do is they'd take a stick, a long stick, well, two meters long or two two yards long, uh, with uh, with a metal point at the end, and you just jab it into the ground, uh, turn it around a couple of times, uh, sort of move it around in a circle a couple of times, and you've opened a hole and a space for your crop to be planted. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it, that's called a dibble stick. That's it's very it, labor it, it intensive. It goes way, way, way back. I don't know, thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now this is a lab lab bean. This one won't grow in the really, really poor soils, but after we use jack bean a couple of years, people always wanna know, well, our soil's really nice now, can we do use something we can eat? And the answer is definitely, yes, there are several. Well, in fact, quite a number, probably 15 or 20 or 30 different species that people can eat. This is my favorite. Uh, I'll tell you why for just, just very quickly. One is the beans are 50% more, have 50% more protein than our common beans do in the United States. So it's far more nutritious. Uh, I also like to use it in Africa because it's a native of Africa, uh, native of East Africa, and people feel a lot of pride in the fact that their beans are better than the European beans. Because for <laughs> centuries they've been taught that everything from Europe was better than everything from Africa. And uh, in this case, that's exactly the opposite of what's the truth. Uh, furthermore, you can, when the leaves are young and tender, not at this stage, this is, this is three months into the dry season. You can see that this is gonna make it through the dry season, okay? We're three months into the dry season. The maize was harvested some time ago, but the, the, the uh, lab lab bean, as you can see way up at the top, is still producing seeds and producing and has green leaves. And it will continue to grow until you kill it and, and plant your next maize crop when the rains come again, after six or seven months of, drou of drought. But the beautiful thing is that I really love about this plant is the leaves are also edible. They can be eaten, uh, when they're young and tender. And uh, they have about the same protein level as our common, as the beans on our common bean plants. And they're just the leaves. 
Furthermore, you can put them under a tree for three days. So if they dry out some, stick them in fertilizer sacks and they will last for 12 months. Now, here we have dark green leaves. That's what they are when you harvest them, which means they have lots of vitamins and minerals. They have as much protein as our beans do, pound for pound. And they're available all year long. And furthermore, they're free because they're a free byproduct of growing the beans. So you have basically what I consider a, a nutritionist's dream, a high protein, high vitamin, high mineral food that's very easy to store, takes very little processing, uh, has proteins, vitamins, and minerals in large quantities, and is available year round. With Roland, very little does, this, does this grow in a temperate climate? Uh, not up here in the States, no. It won't take frost. But it's absolutely wonderful for, for virtually the whole developing world. It's it's now grown all over. In fact, there, there are areas where it's traditional in, in Peru, India, China, uh, several countries of Southeast Asia, two or three countries of, uh, of Africa, including uh, Kenya and Malawi. It's already traditional. And what we're doing is just spreading it to the rest of the U.S. So it would grow in California and in Florida here in this country? Probably Southern California and Florida, yes. Mm -hmm. So I've never tried it, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it would. Now, here's one of the trees we use, Glaricidia. These Glaricidia trees, believe it or not, are only four years old. So they're very fast growing. They produce a tremendous amount of biomass, which is good for the soil. It's also good for the... Um, and it's also good for the uh, cattle. You can see we're toward the end of the dry season. There's nothing on the ground. The cattle have nothing to eat except tons and tons of glaricidia leaves. Uh, the glaricidia leaves are very high in protein and very good for cattle. In fact, they're, they're university educated um, uh, dairy farmers in Northern Honduras, large scale dairy farmers that feed their cattle nothing but pasture grass, Glaricidia leaves and salt leaves. Okay, I mean, it provides all the protein animals could use and a lot of the vitamins and minerals. Uh, the flowers are edible, so people can also eat something off this tree. And uh, furthermore, the, the trees, if they're properly pruned, now in this case, they weren't pruning them very much because they were making so much money off the of seeds because they, these were so popular with other farmers, they were selling the seeds for a dollar a kilo, which was big money for them. But anyway, if you pruned them more heavily, the crops under there would grow much better than they do without any shade at all, because in the lowland tropics, they, we already, with global warming, have an excess of heat. So by having these tree, trees there, you actually increase your maize production. And as you can see, that the, the rows there, the maize rows, well, in this case, millet rows, uh, go right next to the trees. They don't lose a single inch of, of growing space for their, for their food crops. And the food crops will produce far more because of the fertilizer effect of the leaves and the protection from global warming. 